Hey guys, this is Michael from Arlington. So it is not ironic that I went to the Vintage Computer Festival Southwest 3.0. It was held August 4th and 5th at the University of Texas at Arlington, sponsored by the Museum of Information Technology at Arlington. So David, you had asked a question about this museum, if it was a physical museum, and the answer is no, it is not. It is a nonprofit organization with a goal of someday becoming a a physical museum. So let's talk about the exhibits. I think the show did a good job of, of showcasing Texas's role in the history of microcomputers. So like in Fort Worth being the home of Tandy, Radio Shack, Dallas being the home of Texas Instruments, Houston being the home of Compaq, and Austin, Round Rock having uh, so many companies it's almost a miniature Silicon Valley. But down in San Antonio in the late 60s and throughout the 70s was a very important company, first called the Computer Terminal Corporation and later called Data Point. Uh, I've always had, in each of the VCFs that I've attended, always been lucky to have Gordon Peterson, who was a senior software engineer at Data Point, available. In fact, you'd be walking past one of the desks and just see a bunch of corporate paperwork and design documents and think that is the exhibit. But no, you're wrong. Gordon Peterson is the exhibit. You should talk to him. He's a very interesting man, and you can tell he's a genius. So this year, I was really happy to see some some real data point hardware on display. A computer terminal with a with a screen that looks like a, you you think it's a wide screen, like a iPhone on its side, but it, it was real. It was really based on the aspect ratio of a of a punch card. It's kind of chocolate brown and beige, with the screen skewed to the left and and on the top right side is a trap door that would, that would uh, have access to some tape drives. If you question the importance of this machine, take a look at the Wikipedia entry for the Intel 8008 microprocessor, and you'll see this machine referenced in about the second sentence. Check out this next thing. It, it's, uh, I'm going to show you a, a normal Kim first, because I want to show you how it differs from this portable Kim that uh, John had brought up. So normal Kim has the green main board with the calculator keypad in the bottom right corner and the edge connectors along the left side. Here, here we have a, uh, a brown attache case, a brown leather case like my father might have with, with brass hardware on the front. And when you open it up, on the underside of the lid is the Kim rotate 180 degrees so the edge connectors are now towards the center of the case. The keypad has been detached and it's in its own dedicated box with a ribbon cable coming off of it. On the right half of the underside of the lid is a, another board containing extra memory. In the, in the bottom of the briefcase, in the front left side, is a, is a classic 70s tape deck. On the right side is a black metal box that contains a dedicated power supply. You might be quick to dismiss it as the work of some crazy Kim fan, but until you start looking at the, the detail of some of these modifications and how professionally it was done, the owner is starting to think that maybe it was something done by Moss for its own use. Here I have a close-up of the cassette player and over the speaker hole is, is a nicely typed up set of instructions about what the memory locations are for dumping to, to cassette tape or reading from cassette tape. Unfortunately, because this was a, a pawn shop find, the true origin is still a mystery. Next is a photo of three portable Tandy computers, a TRS-80 model 200 clamshell LCD with like a 40 by 16 display, a model 4P, which is supposed, it's probably the largest, the largest portable computer ever made, and, and then the Model 100. And I'd always heard that these were used by reporters because they could be taken anywhere out in the field and last for weeks and weeks on two double A's. And, and then when they finally get ready to submit the story, they just need to find a phone line somewhere. Now I thought, yeah, right, maybe, maybe one guy did that. But lo and behold, here is a Model 100 with an AP Associated Press badge in the bottom right-hand corner. So I stand corrected. Earl, this one's for you. This is a table with Commodore products on it. 
The owner wanted to show the similarities of the design between the 64C, the 128, and the Amiga 500. They all had this spear head profile. So the keyboard kind of goes up as a triangle, and then after the keys, it drops down and then flattens out in the backside. David, I think this is a sentimental favorite of yours, a Commodore SX64 portable. I think it's the best looking thing that Commodore produced. It looks like uh, that badge, that SX64, looks like it'd be on the side of a rocket in Thunderbirds are go. Earl, there is plenty of modern day fun at this show. Here is a TRS-80 color computer, so a Coco One with a VGA output implemented in FPGA. This is a project called the Coco VGA from Brendan Donahue and his collaborator, Steve Spiller. They've piggybacked a rainbow ribbon cable onto the back of a video display generator chip on the motherboard. And they're snooping the address and data lines, horizontal, vertical sync, and other mode and config pins. And they're sending this out to a, a field programmable gate array where it does its magic and eventually sends out a VGA signal to a modern monitor. There were three other FPGA projects on display, implementations of classic computers, the Ohio Scientific Computer implemented in FPGA, an Apple IIe, a Tandy Color Computer 3, and these were all painstakingly implemented by Gary Becker from Austin. He had a, I was talking to him about the Apple IIe because I, I knew a little bit about the hardware there, and he was having to implement all the all the details of say the floppy drive having to send signals to the stepper motor keeping track of the rotational position of the floppy disk at any moment so just tons of work there tons of work another bit of modern day fun was Boise Petra from Cloud9 Tech he gave a presentation about a product he developed called the Liberate 09 which is a a, a chip replacement for an Atari 8-bit computer you can replace the 6502 with a 60 with a Motorola 6809 chip and and also a, a ROM upgrade and you might ask why I would do that and the answer was because you can run this awesome operating system called Nitrous 09 which gives you multi-user multitasking capabilities for an Atari 800 XL it seems like that operating system really shines on the Coco 3 where you can have up to 512k of RAM, but it's nice that it's available for the Atari as well. In fact, I purchased one of these bad boys and look forward to getting it installed as soon as I can. Carrington, an Apple II Plus. <laughs> well, that's it from VCF Southwest 3.0. I'm glad I went. I hope anyone else who's nearby gets to see it next year.